Good morning, everybody. I am delighted to welcome you all to the National Disability Authority's Annual Conference of 2021. In spite of the many challenges thrown at us since the beginning of the pandemic, we're happy to continue to take advantage of people's newfound technological skills by providing an online event that allows for a comprehensive and robust uh, exploration of today's theme. I would like to extend a warm welcome to all of our speakers here today, in particular, Mr. Roderick O'Gorman, TD, Minister for Children, Equality, Disability, Integration and Youth, who will formally open the conference this morning. And to Minister of State with Responsibility for Disability, Ms. Anne Rabbit, TD, who will address uh, the conference, who will deliver an address later today. This year, the theme of the conference will focus on Article 12 of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, equal recognition before the law. And we will focus specifically on work underway to prepare officials, professionals, persons with disabilities, and society as a whole for the introduction of the Assisted Decision-Making Capacity Act of 2015 to be commenced next year. The UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities has, for many years, informed the work of NDA, our work as a statutory independent research and advisory body to government, and it will continue to do so. The NDA is committed to bringing evidence-informed advice and also learning from the experience and the expertise of persons with disabilities to guide the policies, programmes and strategies developed by government. Our work includes the gathering and analysis of data, research on good practice at home and abroad, and the development of technical guidance and frameworks to support transformation of services and systems. In doing so, we seek to understand the challenges that may impact progress and to identify practical solutions and good practice that will support the effective use of resources to achieve the Convention's goals. The Convention also places duties on states with regard to promoting universal design. And Ireland is unique in having a statutory centre for excellence in universal design, which is part of the NDA. And that centre promotes the universal design of the built environment, products, services, and information and communications technology. And the adoption of universal design would mean that all of these things would be easy to access, to understand, and to use by all of us, regardless of our age, size, ability, or disability. So the NDA provides independent analysis and assessments of progress of existing disability strategies and policies. And we look forward to building on our existing uh, work to provide independent analysis and assessment of progress on the UNCRPD and to assist the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission in its role in independently monitoring Ireland's performance and convention. So this is an opportune time to focus on this one complex article of the UN Convention. It's now over three years since Ireland ratified the convention and the initial state report is soon to be sent to the committee on the rights of persons with disabilities. And as we all know, the convention is of major significance because it provides a means for ensuring that persons with disabilities have the same rights as everybody else and opportunities. Now it doesn't provide new rights, but it does make clear how these existing rights can be realized, recognizing the barriers that need to be removed and the need for planned action to demonstrate continued progress and impact. Article 12 of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities is an article that not only demands new structures and processes to be put in place, but also demands a significant shift in societal attitudes. 
it obliges state parties to recognise that persons with disabilities enjoy legal capacity on an equal basis with all other people. States must take appropriate measures to provide persons with disabilities with the support and the empowerment that they need to make decisions uh, about their lives by themselves. We are honoured to welcome Ms. Ro Rosemary Kays, Chair of the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, who will provide us with an overview of Article 12 and what is expected of state parties when implementing it. Now, unfortunately, due to sudden unforeseen circumstances, Rosemary cannot be with us in person as planned this morning. So Dr. Rosalind Tamming, Head of Policy, Research and Public Affairs at the NDA, has kindly agreed to read Rosemary's speech on her behalf. We are also delighted to welcome Alberto Vasquez, a disability rights advocate and lawyer, a senior advisor at the Centre for Inclusive Policy. Now, Alberto is no stranger to these shores as he completed an LLM in International and Comparative Disability Law and Policy at NUI Galway. Alberto will provide insight into the approaches taken by South American countries in respect of supportive decision making and the particular role played by disabled persons organisations in the fight for legal capacity. As you may be aware, the Assisted Decision Making Capacity Act is a long awaited and transformative piece of legislation that was enacted in 2015, but has yet to be commenced in full. Although we understand that work is well advanced on an amendment bill that will support this full commencement as soon as possible in 2022. The legislation introduces new processes for decision-making support arrangements and for advanced planning. However, some of the changes that will be introduced by the legislation go deeper than new structures, bodies and documents. The legislation affirms a person's right to make decisions and to have those decisions respected. It protects fundamental human rights, such as dignity, autonomy and self-determination. It does away with the notion of a decision taken in the best interest of someone else and introduces a new duty for the will and preferences and beliefs and values of the person to be sought, promoted and protected. After the break, we're very pleased to have a programme packed full of experts who will outline how the legislation will impact how they work and describe the measures being taken to prepare for its introduction. Thank you, Anya Flynn from the Decision Support Service, and also Patricia Rickard Clark, who will chair our first panel discussion. And thanks to all our panelists in advance for your time and your very considerable expertise. After lunch, we hope to learn from those who have gone before us, and not in that sense, but in terms of putting in place legislation, policy and practice to support decision making, including learning from England and Wales, Sweden and the USA. We hope that our speakers from these very different countries, Alex, Max and Jonathan, will be able to provide us with guidance around the potential opportunities and pitfalls that lie ahead of us as we face into implementation of the Assisted Decision-Making Act, based on the lessons learned from their respective jurisdictions. Our final panel discussion will feature people whose lives will be directly impacted by the introduction of the legislation. This session will be chaired by our very own Ashling Glynn, who has been on our NDA board for the past four years doing excellent work. We are so happy that Helen, Joe, John and Michael are joining us to discuss what needs to be put in place for the impact of the ADM Act to be felt on the ground. By voicing the hopes and concerns that they have, we believe that department officials, 
professionals and other stakeholders who are attending here today will be further able to identify and develop the supports, training and awareness raising that is needed in order for the effective implementation and successful rollout of the legislation. Finally, we are deeply honoured to have the, that the President of the High Court, Ms Justice Mary Irvine, has agreed to close our conference by sharing some of her extensive experience and knowledge with us. I know that Ms Justice Irvine is committed to making the courtroom accessible uh, to and inclusive of all persons, and she has indicated her desire to hear the voices of people who are not often heard. So with that, let me reiterate once more how welcome you all are to the NDA's annual conference of 2021. I hope you enjoy it, find it informative and thought provoking. Uh, and I will now hand over to Dr. Aideen Hartney, who is the director of the NDA, and she is going to ably steer us through today's event. Thank you all very much for your time and your interest. Thank you very much, Helen. Good morning and welcome everyone. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Aideen Hartney and I'm the Director of the National Disability Authority and I'm going to be acting as your MC for the day. So I just want to quickly run through some housekeeping issues for the day ahead. As you know from the programme, we will have a number of keynote speakers and inputs before moving into panel discussions later this morning and after lunch. You will have the opportunity to ask our speakers questions throughout the day. And this can be done by using the question and answer function, the Q&A function at the bottom of your screens. You can also use this button if you are having any technical difficulties so you can alert a member of the NDA staff in this way, or you can email nda.annualconference at nda.ie. Similarly, if you're having any issues accessing our ISL interpretation or our captioning service, you can use these methods of contact as well. Just to remind you that this conference is being recorded, and will be made available on the NDA website and YouTube channel in the coming weeks. However, as this is a Zoom webinar, the names and the faces of the attendees will not be visible in the recording. As you've just heard from Helen, we have a packed agenda and many fascinating speakers as, you, uh, uh, as we go through the day. So without further ado, we'll press on and I'd like to introduce a pre-recorded address from Minister Roderick O'Gorman, the Minister for Children, Equality, Disability, Integration and Youth. Over to the Minister. Good morning everyone, delighted to be here with you today and it's my pleasure to speak at the NDA annual conference and I know my colleague Minister Rabbit will be speaking to you also. As the Minister with responsibility for both the Assisted Decision Making Capacity Act and the Department responsible for implementing the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, I'm particularly grateful for the chance to contribute today. And I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Aideen Hartney, Director of the National Disability Authority, for extending the invitation to me to speak.
I'm happy to see that the focus of today's event is the practical element of the act. And I've no doubt that today's event will highlight the real and positive change that the act represents to the lives of so many. And I strongly welcome today's focus on those who are and who will be most personally impacted by the act and who will use the decision support service once it's fully operational. Government recognises the importance of the much needed and long overdue reform that this Act represents and has committed to implementing the Act by June of next year, when the Decision Support Service will become fully operational. A suite of new administrative processes and support measures must be put in place before then and Anya Flynn, the Director of the DSS, who is speaking later this morning, is leading on ensuring that the DSS will be ready to take on this important role in summer next year. That work is being supported by a steering group comprising of senior officials from the relevant departments and agencies and I commend Anya and her team in the DSS and others on the group for the work that has already taken place. Amendments are required to the 2015 Act before uh, it can fully commence. My department is working on an assisted decision-making capacity amendment bill which will address a number of issues required to streamline the processes and improve safeguards for those who will re rely on the provisions of the Act. I expect to be in a position to enact that legislation next year and to commence the 2015 Act in full by June. I know that assisted decision-making is eagerly awaited. I've no doubt that the speakers and contributions today will show why that is very powerfully. That is why we need to move swiftly, but we, that is why we also need to get this right. I, as Minister, my department and the government as a whole are committed to the delivery of the required legislation and to supporting the DSS in preparing for going live so that it delivers its vital service and so Ireland can realise a radically different approach to capacity in this country. I wish you all well for the remainder of the conference today and I hope that you really benefit from the various discussions. Thanks very much. Many thanks, Minister, for taking time out of what we all know was a very busy week to provide us with that very important update about the Assisted Decision-Making Capacity Act of 2015. Now, as you know, it would have given us very great pleasure to welcome our, our first keynote speaker this morning, Ms. Rosemary Kays, particularly because as, teaching in, as well as teaching international human rights law at the Faculty of Law at the University of New South Wales, Rosemary is also the current chairperson of the United Nations Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. But unfortunately, as Helen said, due to unforeseen circumstances, Rosemary has been unable to join us at the very last minute. However, she very kindly sent through her speech to us and the NDA's Head of Policy, Research and Public Affairs, Dr. Rosalind Tamming, has agreed to step into the breach to deliver the speech. Unfortunately, Ros won't be able to field any of the questions that we might have had for Rosemary, but it is still great that we do have the opportunity to hear Rosemary's overview of Article 12, as understood by the Monitoring Committee, and what is expected of states parties when working to realise equal recognition before the law for persons with disabilities. So I'll hand over to you now, Roz, with thanks for the last minute substitution. Uh, thank you, Aideen, and good morning, everyone. It's very welcome to see Ireland engaging with reform in the area of autonomy and persons with disabilities. The application of the universal recognition of legal capacity and equality before the law to people with disabilities on an equal basis with others has been an area where countries have been particularly challenged. Equality before the law is guaranteed in Article 6 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Everyone has the right to recognition everywhere as a person before the law and in Article 12 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Everyone shall have the right to recognition everywhere as a person before the law. Article 12 of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, Equal Recognition Before the Law, 
is viewed as critical to the exercise of all other human rights. As a civil and political right, the standard of obligation is one of immediate realization. This means that for countries that have rat ratified the convention, they must immediately begin taking steps towards the realization of the rights provided for in Article 12. Those steps must be deliberate, well-planned, and include consultation with and meaningful participation of people with disabilities and their organizations. Central to equality before the law is legal capacity or the ability to hold rights and the ability to exercise those rights. The exercise of legal capacity has most commonly been denied to people with disabilities in legal systems worldwide. But this denial has also been applied to other groups, particularly women and ethnic minorities. The historical denial of the exercise of legal capacity for women, as for people with disabilities, was largely based on the normative standard within the legal philosophy of the autonomous, rational human being. As for people with disabilities, femaleness was constructed as falling outside of this normative standard. Rationality was considered beyond femaleness and women were viewed as other. This denial or limitation of legal capacity meant that women, particularly following marriage, were unable to enter into contracts, administer property or exercise rights in the justice system with husbands exercising legal capacity on their behalf. The Convention on the Lim Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women refuted the normative standard by explicitly outlining in Article 15 that state parties shall accord to women in civil matters a legal capacity identical to that of men and the same opportunities to exercise that capacity. The historical denial of the exercise of legal capacity for people with disabilities is based on the medical model of disability, which conceptualizes disability as a deficit located in the individual, a deviation from bodily, cognitive and mental norms that requires a range of medical and expert interventions to diagnose, treat and cure. In not meeting the normative standard of human being, people with disabilities are viewed as different, as exceptions, as other, requiring care, treatment and protection within social welfare and health regimes as a way of dealing with their perceived special needs. The Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities codifies a human rights model of disability. The Convention recognizes disability as a social construct, values impairment as part of human diversity and human dignity, and, infer and affirms that impairment can never be the basis for the denial or diminishment of human rights. The Convention refutes the devalued perceptions of persons with disabilities and requires a social transformation of law, policy and practice, rather than the continual focus on fixing or reforming existing systems that are built on ableist notions of disability. Legal capacity is instrumental to personhood. In the words of Ireland's own George Quinn, the special rapporteur on the rights of persons with disabilities, it gives rise to individual agency that enables people to sculpt their own lives, to open up zones of personal freedom and interactions. Personhood and making one's own choices are about, about the minutiae of daily life, what to wear, what to eat, what time to get up, as well as more significant life decisions, such as deciding who to vote for, deciding who, when, and if to marry, choosing where to live, consenting to medical treatment, entering into contracts, deciding wh whether to have children and how many, and managing personal finances. The denial of legal capacity is a denial of personhood. As Jers Quinn has pointed out in the context of this denial, there are some human beings who, whilst being human, are not persons. So where is the line between those humans that are persons and those who are not? In a way, 
substitute decision making is a symptom of civil death or the of the surrender of the personhood of one person to another. The recognition that people with disabilities are able to exercise legal capacity on an equal basis with others is a recognition of their personhood and underpins the shift from a medical to a human rights model. During the negotiations for the Convention on Rights of Persons with Disabilities, UN member states had to recognize that their established law, policy and practice frameworks denied or limited legal capacity for people with disabilities on the basis that people with disabilities are incapable of exercising legal rights and duties, that they need protection and they need decisions to be made for them in their best interests. While noting that the convention should recognize equality before the law and the legal capacity of people with disabilities, many member states continued to articulate deficit views about the degree and quality of impairment that impacted on the decision-making ability. Noting, for example, that the convention should also accommodate exceptional situations where people with disabilities are adjudicated to be incompetent and unable to exercise their legal rights. Systems of substitute decision-making and legal mechanisms to deem lack of capacity were still viewed as being necessary to protect those people with disabilities who were viewed as incapable and to protect the integrity of legal decisions. The arguments made by member states demonstrated that the concept of legal capacity was continually conflated with the concept of mental capacity or the individual capacity to make decisions. Legal capacity is an inherent right of all people, while mental capacity recognizes that people, including people with disabilities, will have different decision-making skills that will vary depending on their circumstances and may require individualized support to assist this decision-making. Perceived or actual impairment of mental capacity is not a justification for the denial of legal capacity, but rather a recognition of the potential need for support to exercise legal capacity. The convention negotiations were about grappling with the application of this right to autonomy for people with disabilities, when it had previously not been seen as being applicable to people with disabilities. Organizations of people with disabilities continually highlighted that the failure to recognize legal capacity and the fundamental right to make decisions with support had resulted in institutionalization, forced sterilization, and countless human rights infractions for people with disabilities all over the world, and has often led to a denial of the right to own property, to marry, to inherit, to sign contracts, to hold bank accounts to sign documents, or even to vote in public elections. The chair of the ad hoc committee that was charged with negotiating the convention provided his draft text based on the discussions over previous sessions in order to streamline the process and bridge different positions. In relation to equal recognition before the law, the chair noted that all member states needed to be flexible and be prepared to resolve differences bearing in mind that guardianship or substitute decision-making for persons with disabilities has led to many injustices in the past. What the chair was foreshadowing was for member states to recognize the need for reform in order for, to facilitate a social transformation, a transformation that would affirm the personhood of people with disabilities so that they could enjoy autonomy rights on an equal, equal basis with others. The final agreed text of the convention, Article 12, Equal Recognition Before the Law, reflects the text of the convention on the elimination of all forms of discrimination against women and states, states that state parties shall recognize that persons with disabilities enjoy legal capacity on an equal basis with others in all aspects of life. In doing so, Article 12 refutes the ableism inherent in law, policy and practice that denies or limits the exercise of legal capacity based on impairment. 
while Article 12 is emblematic of the conceptual shift from the medical to human rights model of disability, member states continue to grapple with this complex reform area and the practical application of this right to people with disabilities. One aspect of the social transformation required by the Convention requires embedding impairment as a recognized part of human diversity and dignity in new legal frameworks that apply to everyone equally, that establish supported decision-making mechanisms and that allow for the legal integrity of decision-making, consent and contractual arrangements to be maintained without denying human rights to people with disabilities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roz, for again stepping in at the last minute to deliver that hugely insightful pr presentation from Rosemary Kays. I know many of our attendees will find it particularly timely, given that Ireland's state report will be submitted to the UN Monitoring Committee in the coming weeks, and the state will then begin preparing for its interactive dialogue with that committee. Without further ado, we will now move on to our next keynote speaker. Alberto Vasquez is a lawyer and disability rights advocate from Peru. He holds an LLM in international and comparative disability law and policy from the National University of Ireland, Galway. He works as a senior advisor at the Centre for Inclusive Policy, and he previously worked as research coordinator at the Office of the UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Alberto will speak to us about the impressive advances made in South America in respect of supported decision-making. And just a reminder that if you have questions for Alberto, you can submit them through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, and I will then put as many as time allows to Alberto before we go to coffee. But for now, Alberto, you are very welcome and over to you. Well, first of all, thank you very much for this invitation. It's always good to be even if virtually connected with Ireland, um, where I spent a wonderful year and more memories every time I come back. Um, I'm gonna present on so what is happening in, in, I would say, Latin America rather than South America, just to include Costa Rica in that. Um, I have prepared uh, a presentation that I think it will help to, to follow the presentation uh, better. So let me share my screen. Okay, it seems it's working. So let me let me start with, with a little bit of context because I think people hear all the time that Peru, Costa Rica, Colombia are doing reform, have done reform on legal capacity and support decision making. And, and I think it's important to understand in which context those reform took place. Um, the first thing I would like to say is it's not just Costa Rica, Peru, and Colombia that have worked on, 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 on reforms of legal capacity. Actually, Argentina and Brazil have done also very important steps to implement Article 12 of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And in Mexico, for example, the Supreme Court of Mexico has been well aligned with, with what Rosemary has said in terms of what are the standards that they Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability requests to implement Article, the committee um, is, is suggesting to implement Article 12. So that's just one first aspect to, to keep it in mind that these reforms are part of bro a broader effort in the region to implement the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. The second issue that is important is these three countries that I would say have achieved major reforms on legal capacity, the three countries are monist country. And, and for those or you that are not familiar with this term, it's 
basically international law and, and, and human rights uh, uh, covenants and treaties, when, when they are ratified by these countries, they're part of the internal uh, framework. It's, so, and that puts an extra pressure on countries to act upon those international obligations because any any person can claim those rights in courts so they don't have to be acknowledging legislation to advance the agenda this is what is happening for example in mexico but also help to push the agenda in other countries a third consideration that is important to keep in mind is these three countries and most of the region we have a civil law tradition a romano-germanic law which is different from the common law and to put it in simple words, the civil law tradition is based on written law, while the common law tradition is more based on, 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 on the work of courts and case law. So we have in those countries a very strong reliance on legislation and the civil code, which is the main piece of legislation in, in the civil framework, is the piece of legislation where you will find discussions about capacity, property, family. So many of the pieces of law that you will have in, in, in the common law system that are developed through case law in our civil law tradition will be concentrated in the civil code. So many of these efforts have been achieved through legal reform, the implementation of Article 12 has achieved through legal reform, partly also because the law has a very important role in our tradition. And, but also, it's true, changing the civil law is one of the most hard things in our countries. And all of these countries also, we have a very traditional guardianship system that will be based on what people used to call this, the status approach to legal capacity. That means most of our civil code will have a list of people, and to be more exact, conditions that uh, uh, that will that of, of, of people that could be uh, under guardianship. So person with intellectual disabilities, with psychosocial disabilities, not necessarily with the best language, but you will have a classification of people that could fall under guardianship. So it was a very traditional system, not really similar to what you may know happened in other common law countries where the, where the tradition moved towards a um, more functional assessment of legal capacity. And then finally, I would say all these countries have taken very seriously the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and have not challenged really the interpretation of the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And that has made these reforms informed really but the standards of the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And you can see that through all these different efforts. So, as the title said, I think it's important to acknowledge too that all these processes, and I, I would, and I'm going to focus on, as I said, Costa Rica that did the reform in 2016, then Peru that did the reform in 2018, and then Colombia that did a similar reform in 2019. All those three countries, and, and, and we recently did a, 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 a paper on this and you could see that all these processes has been driven by civil society and more specifically organizations and persons with disabilities and more specifically in the case of Colombia and Peru organizations of persons with intellectual disabilities and their families and organizations of persons with psychosocial disabilities including through the drafting itself in, in Costa Rica and Peru and, 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 and in Colombia People, organizations, persons with disabilities were the ones drafting the reform and then campaigning for the reform. And this has been very long advocacy processes. In average, seven years in each country, a little bit more, a little bit less, depending on the country. But the draft bill took a couple of years at least to be developed. And then the campaigning also took, took time. And that means that there has been some time also to create awareness about this reform coming. And in the case of Colombia and Peru, what you have also is 
support the decision making pilot projects that help, I think, to demonstrate the, the usefulness of this exercise. Not only that this exercise is right, because we have human rights considerations behind, but also that could work. So very small pilot project, but it's still important to create, um, to shift perceptions. Then we have, as part of the process, broad coalitions that have been built between, it's true, DPOs were driving the process, but at the same time, coalitions with universities, human rights experts, families, all of them joining the advocacy. If someone lo was lost in this, is, is one, if one group was, was missing there, probably was civil lawyers, that especially academics on, on civil law, that had very limited involvement. And probably that's one of the reasons that we achieved these reforms, because now they are the most critical on, on, on what has been achieved. And then at some point, we got the buy-in of government in all of, the, all of these three countries. In Costa Rica, at very high level with the vice president, in Colombia, through the national, through the national uh, authority on disability, in Peru, through the Congress and through the judicial system, and through also the national authority of disability. So we got government support that made the last step uh, easier and to happen. Because as I said, many, after many years, people were getting tired, but government support, support came at the end and, and, and helped to achieve these reforms. But I suppose at this moment, after many years, better than focusing on the process, let's, let's talk about the content of those reforms. And those reforms are quite different. Probably the Colombian and the Peruvian reform are similar to each other. And, and we learn from the processes in, in other countries, as, as the case in Costa Rica, but we have very common aspects between the three of those reforms. Sometimes the commonalities came through the regulations that tried to explain better the gaps that we found, for example, in the, in the case of Costa Rica, regulation helped to bring the, 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 the CRPD committee interpretation closer to the, to the national standards or the national standards closer to the interpretation of the committee, but we have commonalities. One of them has been on all these three countries, there is a clear recognition of universal legal capacity for all persons with disabilities. The general, the, the, the general, the, 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 this is a general recognition on this, the three reforms. And there is no exceptions based on, on mental capacities. There is no exception made of type of impairment. There is an overall recognition of legal capacity of all persons with disabilities um, of, or of all adults with disability. And clear understanding that legal capacity means both the capacity to hold rights and the capacity to exercise rights. A second aspect will be the abolition of, sorry, just push the wrong button. The, the second aspect will be the abolition of guardianship. As I said, these three countries have very old guardianship systems. So the three countries made an effort to abolish guardianship based on disability. So person with disability cannot be placed anymore under guardianship. I will go back to that when I, when I explain some of the limitations because technically guardianship is still exists, for example, in Peru for other groups, but just to, to keep in mind that guardianship based on disability has been eliminated and there is no guardianship based on mental capacities or, 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 or something along the lines. Another similar common, common aspect is that reasonable accommodation has been a key component of this reform. I think it took a long time for, I think, the disability community to acknowledge that just through reasonable accommodation, we can ensure access to the support people need for exercising legal capacity. And I think we, we underuse that tool in, in many of the previous discussions but now in all the three reforms, you have that, that acknowledgement of the importance of reasonable accommodation for support decision making. Fourth, all these reforms include supported decision making options. Costa Rica has 
only one type of support decision making that is true courts, but the Colombia and Peru have different entry points for support decision making. And I will go back to that. I just want to finish with these common aspects. A fifth common aspect I would say is safeguards are very broad and general. To some extent that it could be said that is underdeveloped in all those three forms. There is an emphasis that safeguards will come to courts, but not clarity on what does it mean vision repeating the standard that has been established by the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. So I think that's an aspect that is common and I would probably say is one of the limitations in terms of these three reforms. And finally, something very important as part of this safeguard, and I think that's a, that's a good aspect of that, they have, all the three countries has kept the notion of best interpretation of will and preference as the guiding, as the guiding framework to dealing with hard cases. Um, and, and again, I will go back to that in the next slide. So let me go back to the support decision making. I said the three countries have replaced guardianship with support decision making. And in the three countries, support is voluntary. So people cannot be forcibly placed under, under a support measure. There, is some, there are some caveats there. In the case of Colombia, for example, the legislation established that once you have established a support decision-making uh, voluntarily, you have established a support decision-making arrangement, it may be that you need to use your supporter to actually engage in legal acts. Um, there is an attempt to interpret that particular provision in a broader sense, so it's not so restrictive, because that means in practice that support decision making could be uh, that if you don't have a supporter, to some extent, if you don't have your supporter, to some extent, your legal capacity is limited. So there is some discussion there, and it's still part of how this is going to play out in the implementation. Something also very similar in the three countries is there is no mental capacity assessment to be under a support decision making regime. So people choose to be, and people, and people establish according to their will and preference, how this support is gonna be provided. There is one difference in the case of Colombia, which I think is a, is a contribution, and it shows also that it's a, it's a reform that came later. They have a process for support assessment. It's not assessing the mental capacity of the individual, it's assessing the support needs of individuals. And this, this assessment is voluntary, although you always have to do it if you want to do an, a judicial adjudication of support. But I, again, just to, to repeat, there is no mental capacity assessment as part of this. Then supporters can be natural persons or legal persons, although in the three of them, again, there is a preference for trusted people as supported. And again, I think this follows very well with the general comment number one of the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities that puts an emphasis on natural support and, and, and communities. And, and then Colombia and Peru have included support and decision of making agreements that could be done privately. So you can go, again, in our, in our context, we have notaries that play different than notaries in the common law system. Notaries are the ones that help you to do contract, and you actually have to go through a notary sometimes to actually register, for example, um, property, um, uh, inheritance. So many of the transactions, you, got, you have to go through a notary. So in the same way, now people can go to a notary to do a support decision and make an agreement, which helps significantly because takes you away from the judicial system but even with the change of legislation, we'll have a different understanding of how capacity works. So I think this will significantly reduce the role of the judicial system in, 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 in the exercise of legal capacity and the provision of support decision making and, and provides more flexibility. Then in the case of Peru or Colombia, again, there is the possibility to, to, to do advanced directives 
Uh, and in the case of Colombia, even the unbacked directives are a little bit, a bit more sophisticated. Um, and finally, the three countries provide the option also to go to the judicial system for a, a judicial appointment of supporters. And in the case of Colombia and Peru, exceptionally, it could be initiated by third parties. Costa Rica also provides for that, but as I said, in the case of Costa Rica, all support decision-making arrangements have to go through courts. Not, that's not the case of Peru or Colombia, where you can, you can opt, you can have an advance directive, you can do a support decision-making agreement as, as a private contract, or you can go to the judge even as a voluntary, as a voluntary route to register your support decision-making agreement, but exceptionally in the case of, in some specific cases, this process of judicial appointment of supporters can be initiated by third parties. And let me go there. So we will say those are the cases that we will have a longer conversation about how this align with, with the respect of legal capacity. And you have similar standards in the three countries. When a third party can be the one triggering a process to appoint a supporter, one or many supporters, obviously. So in the case of Costa Rica, for example, the standard is there is absolute impossibility that limits the person with a disability to submit the application personally or with the support with another person. In the case of Colombia, is when the person is unable, absolutely unable to express their will and preference by any possible communication means, more, mode or, or format. And when there, and an additional requirement that there is a risk of violations or threat of rights. Peru is very similar. Third party intervention is, solo, is only allowed when the person cannot express their will after having made real considerable and pertinent, pertinent efforts including through reasonable accommodation and provision of informal support, plus when it's necessary for the exercise and protection of rights. And in all these three cases, so if we have a person that we cannot know what's their will and preference, and we feel the rights may be at risk, so a third party, family, each legislation will have their own criteria, could start a process not to restrict legal capacity, not to appoint a guardian, but to explore what kind of support the person may need. And this process should be guided by the best interpretation of will and preference, which is recognized in the three countries and has some specific standards. And the support provided through that regime that will be decided by the court will be again guided by the best interpretation of the preference. So in that way, it's following the standard of the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disability. But of course, this is open to, to discussion. What are some of the limitations and challenges of this reform? I would say first that as in many countries, especially low and middle income countries, you have always the gap between the law and the practice. So there is a lot to do there, not only with the design of the law, but also with the capacity of countries to implement and enforce legislation. But, but, but the more concrete challenge is, in the case of Peru, for example, guardianship remains open, actually, for other groups. Um, a person in Peru, a person uh, with, with, with drug abuse problems could be placed under guardianship still. And that's a, that's a big issue. And then we have also the problem that in many of our countries, not necessarily in Colombia, because that has been abolished actually, but in the region in general, there is something called prodigality, which is when an individual expend, expend their, their assets to an extent that could be put in danger the, 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 the family the family assets and put in danger the, the, the future heritage to those assets because in our civil countries you actually have for, forced heirs that have an expectation on, on, on the family 
uh, assets. So that's one very specific thing that has remained, but guardianship cannot be on the basis of disability. Uh, so it will have to go through other options if, and of course, that's a limitation because there is always a risk that could be used for that. Then more practical issues like lack of awareness and training, prior implementations, Peru and Costa Rica jumped into it the next into it the next day legislation was was adopted so the implementation has been not so smoothly and Costa Rica actually put it uh, Colombia put different timelines for different parts of the implementation then we had delays on the implementation and problems with the transitions in Costa Rica and Colombia we had actually resistance from many stakeholders um, the, the, the reform in Costa Rica was challenged by one of the courts that asked the constitutional, uh, the constitutional court, they don't have a constitutional court, the Supreme Court, the constitutional chamber, to review if the law was um, in line with the constitution. The, the constitutional chamber of the Supreme Court said yes. And similarly in Colombia, there has been many lawsuits from different stakeholders against, against the law reform because it may put in danger, according to them, uh, other rights of persons with disabilities now that there is no guardianship. But again, in Colombia, the constitutional courts, at least in one of the cases, and I think it's gonna be the same with the, with the rest of the cases, has confirmed that these reforms are in line with the constitution because they are aligned with the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Another limitation is that there is an over-reliance on families and community networks, which is not bad per se, but there is no formal support services. So those, and just to put it in a context, we didn't have formal guardians neither before. It was mostly families and community networks. Um, and, and sometimes the government taking the role of guardian in institutions. But it's similar now that it is expected that families and community networks will take over in providing the support, but there is no support or formal services from the government. So there is a need for investment in terms of how do we support these families and communities to actually provide good support decision making. And finally, and, 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 and I will jump into that now, is the unclear impact on health and mental health related legislation, which I know that's something that will, that, 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 that is a question that everybody has, because I think there is this narrative that reforms on, on, on legal capacity in Latin America are not comprehensive because are leaving out mental health and health related issues, uh, which is partially true, but I think there has been also some some evolution into that, that I think is still make those reforms a good step forward. Costa Rica doesn't have, for example, mental health legislation. Um, and, and, and they only have a very broad general exception to informed consent in the general health legislation, which is the rule for everyone is um, informed consent is always required, except in emergency interventions. That's a general rule for accidents for anyone in the, in the health system, not just for persons with disabilities. But of course, when you read it through disability lens, that's a risk, especially when you think in terms of what does it mean emergency interventions in the context of mental health? And, 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 and how do we define that the person cannot provide informed consent in those cases? A similar problem has arisen in Colombia because Colombia, the, 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 the law reform actually abolished provisions of involuntary commitment that they previously had in a disability specific law. So the interpretation that many of us were expecting from there was there is not no involuntary treatment or commitment anymore because they expressly abolished those provisions. And it's true now true, there is no judicial procedure, for example, for involuntary commitment. But again, you have hanging there this general exception to informed consent in case of emergencies. And, and that's something, and, and in the case of Colombia, it's even more complicated because the practice has continued 
based on regulations of the Ministry of Health for reimbursement of treatment uh, to mental health services. So there is a pending discussion in Colombia how they're actually going to apply this to the context of mental health uh, services, despite that the law expressly abolished it. In Peru, it has been a, li a little bit more straightforward. And, and of course, initially, again, similar to Costa Rica and Colombia, practice go back to there is a general exception to inform consent in emergency interventions and with a lot of problematic issues about how we understand emergency interventions. But then in 2019, one year after the reform on legal capacity, we had our first mental health law in the country. And our first mental health law repeated this general statement that informed consent is not required only in cases of emergency interventions, but it used the term psychiatric emergency, which complicated the situation. Despite that, the mental health law didn't regulate involuntary treatment and involuntary commitment, just left that open, which is very risky. But then the regulations took it and clarified many things that I think is a big contribution. First, it clarifies that in emergency interventions, as with physical emergencies, people is able to, to consent or, or refuse consent to treatment. So it's clear now, according to the regulations, that if, even in a psychiatric emergency, somebody can refuse treatment. And only when the person is unable to express informed consent by any means, including informal support and reasonable accommodation, the person can be, can, it doesn't use the term involuntary, but I think that's what happened in the practice, will be sent to a mental health facility to deal with the psychiatric, will receive care during the psychiatric emergency. But it puts a limit for 72 hours, and it doesn't include isolation, electroconvulsive treatment, and even administration of psychotropic drugs. All those three are prohibited. So basically, is during a psychiatric emergency when the person cannot provide informed consent by any means, then the person will, will, will receive care up to 72 hours, aiming to that the person decide later what to do with, uh, in terms of providing or refusing consent to treatment. Alberto, uh, I'm very sorry to interrupt, but um, we have lots of very good questions coming in, so I want to make sure we leave enough time for those. So maybe you might go through your final slide quite quickly. This is my final slide. So just to, to share some of the lessons learned there, I think this reform happened because the buy-in from most stakeholders, not all, but most stakeholders. But I think is what, what we have learned is we need more clear government responsibilities and leadership of the implementation because we're seeing problems with implementation. And early awareness, raising and training, the cultural change is a key aspect. I think moving out things from the, from the judicial system has helped to ensure that cultural change. But then how do we deal with the development of support systems and services? And in the case of Colombia, I think it's showing that having clear interpretation guidelines is helping with the implementation. But that's all from me. And I know you have a lot of questions, so happy to, to start answering them. Thank you so much, Alberto. And again, apologies for uh, cutting you off there at the end. But it was great to hear so much about some countries that we don't often uh, examine uh, or get the opportunity to hear about. So as I mentioned, we have a lot of questions coming in through the Q&A function. And, and if people still have questions, they can send them through. If we don't get a chance to answer them all before the coffee break, we can log them all and, and try and get an answer after the conference. But firstly, Alberto, can I ask, have any of these countries been um, at their dialogue with the committee since these reforms were introduced? And what was the reaction? Well, they have been in dialogue. They didn't get yet any of the new concluding observations, but they started with the with the with the 
they already have a, a list of issues, at least in the case of Peru, for example. I think that's the case also of, of Costa Rica. I think there is, we know directly because the CRPD committee former chair has been outspoken very clearly on supporting the reform in, in, in the case of Peru. In the case of Peru has been actually quite interesting because we got like a commandment from the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights, the chair of the CRPD committee, the office of the High Commission of Human Rights, Human Rights Watch. And so I think that has been significant in support of, the, of, of that reform. Um, and I think similar process, although less publicly happened with Colombia. I think the one in Costa Rica raised more questions in terms of it doesn't has it doesn't have all the elements to be a comprehensive reform. There is has a lot of gaps in terms of uh, how it's going to be implemented. They have done a good job through the regulations that help, let's say, to clarify some of the gaps. But still, I wouldn't say all the provisions in the in the Costa Rican reform are CRPD compliant. Um, but I think most of the provisions in the case of, of, of Peru and Colombia have been, uh, with some caveats, of course, and, and, and everything needs to be, everything is perfect. Well, everything can improve, but I think it has been a very good attempt to get closer to the standard of the, of the, of, of the CRPD committee. Great, thank you. I have a question in here that asks, um, when you talk about the third party uh, getting involved, is there an actual process to prove that they did use any and all communication means before the decision about a person's capacity? No, no, there is no specific process. But again, this is, this is I think it, 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 it's, it's related to the legal system, how it works. So you wouldn't have that normally very detailed a, a standard because in that case you will have to go to courts so it's in the court the first the, the first aspect of the process will be to understand if they actually the, there has been all these efforts made to ensure that the person has uh, have, is, is enabled to communicate by any means or mode or everything and that's why it's, it's more concerning how it's going to work this for in the mental health framework because then you may not have an involvement during the emergency situation of course although that is actually what is suggested now in the in the regulations of peru so how in practice it's going to work we're not clear we know for the case law that we're getting now in terms of how this is implemented in courts that courts are still not completely understanding the paradigm shift that it means. But so you may still have, the thing is they don't have another option. So the worst case scenario that we're having now is that the courts may not be so thoughtful in terms of when the person needs support, but they cannot limit legal capacity, even if they want to. And, and the, the, the worst outcome will be that they may place someone in a, in a support relationship um, that may not respond to what the person actually wants. But the person actually has the opportunity during the process to say, look, I don't want the support. So take away this and, and that will be that will fall under the, 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 the protection of the law in, in, in all the three cases. OK, thank you. So if someone tries to abuse of this, to place someone in a support relationship, I think is a risk still. And of course, there is the risk of undue influence. And that's why those cases go through court to avoid that. But of course, there is always the risk that someone may try to use that. The court will be the place to discuss if that's the situation. And, and but there will be no limitation on legal capacity. Okay. And, and a related question then to, to what you've just been talking about, is there an actual definition of what constitutes a, a trusted person? That's in no, Nile Grieving. No, but that's actually, again, that has been mentioned in the three reforms as one of the criteria for the courts when they go through a trip. Individual can appoint whoever they want. There is no requirement on that. 
So if you want to appoint someone you don't even trust, that's your free will. But if you go through the third party intervention to appoint a, a supporter, then the court will have to explore in your, in your networks, what could be the best play person taking into account not only the best interpretation of will and preference, but one, one, one concept there is go for the trust, a person that has a relation of trust with the individual. So that's one of the criteria that the court will use to appoint the supporter, but in such cases, because otherwise the individual can appoint whoever they want. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have a question in, um, you mentioned some of the challenges getting um, the, the, the legal professionals or the civil lawyers uh, engaged in this process. Um, so somebody is asking, how did you go or how did the countries go about getting the support? Was it through their representative body? And maybe you could say a little bit more about what the particular challenges were or were there other sectors that, that were resistant to these reforms? I think in the three persons were different. The, in the case of Costa Rica, it was really a, a bill that was drafted by some people in the disability community and some experts that was there hanging around. It went to Congress, it, it, it got archived, it didn't, it didn't get imposed until they got political support with the private president and then was so fast that was almost no debate. And um, in the case of Colombia, they actually had a coalition with the government sitting there, with DPOs, with, with uh, human rights uh, experts, with universities that sit together, work together on the draft, campaign for the drugs together, and, and, and go through Congress. But again, without probably involving all the, all the stakeholders that could represent uh, a, a future threat to the reform. That's why they got many lawsuits from some family organizations, from some civil lawyers, that they felt the reform didn't respond to all their concerns about protection. In the case of Peru, we did a similar process in Colombia in terms of building coalition. We engaged some of the civil lawyers, but we realized, to be completely honest, because I was part of that campaign, that civil lawyers were the hardest people to convince to and and then we move forward with most of them without most of them um, and that's why after the reform in peru at least you get a lot of publications saying this has been a bloodshed of the of the of, of the civil code um, um, you have destroyed the logic of of, of the of, of the protection system for adults. Um, but because we had the support of the government, because we had the support of the, of, of, of the judicial system and some part of the notaries, so it's more an academic discussion now in terms of how this is gonna work because families were convinced and it was very important that the old system didn't work. So they wanted to move forward with a new system. Um, but still, the transition process has been has been a little bit messy. Okay, okay. Um, Karen Finnerty asks about the pilot projects that you mentioned. Um, are were there particular outcomes from those projects that you know about? Yes. So, in Latin America, I think there has been three pilot projects on support decision making. Um, one in Argentina, one in Colombia, and one in Peru. The three of them very small. 20 people around each of them. Um, the, the focus has been on, on both persons with intellectual and psychosocial disabilities. How does it work in practice? Um, driven by civil society. So civil society, is the, I would say that's, that's a common thing in many of these countries. Uh, civil society got international funding to do those pilots. They last a couple of years in each case. And the outcomes have been very mixed in terms of, I think, and, and we just published a, a paper on that recently, so I can share that. But one of the limitations we see is, it's not clear what it was measuring uh, in terms of building the relationship 
promoting autonomy and one of the one of the experience we have now because we're doing a, a, a follow up with the with the Peruvian pilot project where we are we're actually in the middle of a second pilot project in terms of how we can scale scale up down now that in terms of uh, how this can help to implement the law reform is that many people that went through the many people and their families that went through this process they feel at the end of the process maybe we don't need a support arrangement formalized because we can provide now support on an informal basis. It works. There is no limitations to legal capacity. Maybe we don't need to, uh, to formalize a support agreement, which is something we were not expecting, for example, now in this second pilot project. And it may be that this is linked with the new uh, legislation framework that doesn't ask you to have formalized relationship to exercise your legal capacity. So I think it's making us to rethink a little bit what's the outcome of this. And, and, I, and, and from experiences that we have seen in other countries, and what we're seeing in Peru at least, is, is the pilot project, if, I, if we can do all this again, is how you build a good support relationship between the individual and, and, and a network of supporters. How, how, how you ensure the right ethics, how you ensure a right-based approach, how you ensure that, but also how you ensure that like uh, material support is available because that's one of the challenges of, of, of people because otherwise it feels like everything is under, is, 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 is over the families to provide all the support these individuals need, but society is not changing and there is no, no governmental support, no? Okay. Well, I think that brings us uh, very nicely to the end of our time, Alberto, and I want to thank you for being so generous to um, accept being in the spotlight for longer than might have been expected when you joined us this morning and, and answering those questions. And apologies to everyone whose question we didn't get to, um, but we'll see if we can get a chance to circle back later on. So thank you very much, Alberto, for that fascinating insight. And we will break now for coffee and reconvene at 11.25. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.